welcome one and all. It's time for a tournament report. This time, it's Dead Zone. So there haven't been too many of these in recent months since I've spent more time running Dead Zone events than I've spent attending them. But here we go, the Forge Fathers are out on the table again. And as I show you my entire strike team for this 150 point event, right there, you'll see that's not a lot of models for 150 points, is it, with the Forge Fathers? And that is true. <clears throat> However, I feel like I've kind of run the plague into the ground now. I don't think I need to be playing as the plague. If I'm not going to be playing tournaments very often, I would rather do something that's fresh and fun and I haven't played for Forge Fathers anywhere near as much as I have the plague. But I've also had nowhere near the success as I had with the plague, with the Terratons and the Plague Hounds. So, very successful, but they've been semi-retired for the moment and the Forge Fathers are out. And what have we got here? We have got a Juggernaut. Now, this is the slightly less expensive walker, and also the slightly less expensive version of that walker. So, the Iron Ancestor, who I really like a lot, especially the really expensive one, with the short range, really powerful guns. Unfortunately, it's just too expensive for 150 points, I think. So, we've gone for the cheapest possible walker, which is the Juggernaut Torture, which has a nice AP3 drill for close combat, and a range 3 flamethrower, which also has AP1 as well. So, nice in combat and a good short range flame attack and setting things on fire is always good in Dead Zone. We have got a Forge Guard Huskarl here, which is the second best or second most expensive commander you can take. Not the Forge Lord, but the Huskarl. And his special splat ability on the command dice is that he can reduce the AP of incoming attacks. So, that doesn't have to be spent on himself either. So, any of my models with armor, which are these three, get attacked by anything with AP, I can reduce that by spending one of his splat results on the command dice. Then we've got two brockers here, who are just your standard infantry with no armour, but they are good at fighting in close combat, if they can get there. And the brocker Valkyr, the bike, which has to stay on the ground floor, but it's pretty tough as well. It's resilient, it's got evade, and it's just pretty good all around as well. It's got some nice shooting ability with weight of fire on its guns. And then finally we've got the Forge Guard right there. So not quite as good at shooting as the Huskarl, but just as defensive. So the Forge Guard, when they take their first wound, if they don't take a second one, then they can use their uh, life support system to remove that wound once. So they have armor too, all these three big beefy guys at the back there, armor 2, and then no armor at the front. So, uh, good evening, and I'm not sure which part of that uh, might be your name, so I'm just going to refer to you by the first bit of it, which is Raz, says yay, hello there, unless you tell me what your name is, if you want to clarify that, that would be uh, good for you, if you want to be addressed. Into the first scenario and it is Scatter. So, what kind of missions do I think this strike team will struggle with? I don't think this one is much of a problem. All the objectives are close-ish together, and I don't want to be spreading out too much because I don't have speed apart from this guy who has to stay on the ground, so a lot of the objectives will be away from him. And I've got everything else is really slow. So slow and can't get off the ground level. So I don't want to be moving around all over the table to reach objectives. So this is a quite a decent start for me, scenario-wise. Everything pretty much in striking distance of another objective, or two objectives, or even three. So I could be sitting on this one with a Juggernaut and then set fire to any of the other objectives, potentially. That would be cool. And then you deploy diagonals like that, and you have to put half your strike team in each, which can affect lines of sight. So if you've got, for example, a big open bit of line of sight down there, you might not want to put the models you don't want to get shot in this bit. But then this one might have really bad lines of sight from there, or really good lines of sight, should I say. So you've got to factor in two different directions. Now, this is an Easter-themed event. Eggs termination at Clan Shots in Ghoul. And the Ghoul is the name of the place, the name of the town, by the way. That's not just some kind of slight on the people there. I don't know if they describe themselves as ghouls or ghoulies, but this Easter egg in a Dalek's body this Eggs Terminator 
is going to appear on the table at the start of the second round, and if it lands near to any models, it's going to shoot them or assault them. And it's got a pretty decent gun, and it's all around pretty scary. But if you can kill it, you get two victory points. And if you retrieve the egg after it's killed, then not only do you get to eat the egg, which is obviously more of a benefit than any in-game currency, but you also get one extra victory point as well. So if you kill it in close combat, you get three victory points. If you shoot it down, you get two, and then first one to go and grab the egg off the ground gets the third one. So it's not all bad if it lands near you. And there are the eggs, Terminator tanks stats. So it can phase through walls, but it only moves one space. But then again, it only needs to be shooting mainly to be effective, so it doesn't need to get that close to you. And after it shoots, it will then move towards the nearest target. If there are multiple targets nearby, then it'll randomly determine which one to go after. And there's a wildly experimental gaming mat in round one, which is rules committee approved. And the dead zone mat has been cut into four strips and they have kind of been zigzagged a little bit to one side. So it doesn't greatly increase the distance between any of the particular areas of the board, but it does make some interesting line of sight blocking as the edge of the table or the edge of the board here would block line of sight. So if you're starting in this corner here, you can't then see here, for instance, if you're standing there, because that is considered a solid object. So just something a little bit interesting in round one, and this may be something that works its way into the full dead zone rules eventually, who knows? I think it's pretty cool. It doesn't change the game too wildly. So we've got two objectives on the higher level, so the bike can't get to those two, nor can it get to this one pointer up there. So the bike is pretty much restricted and can only go after this one because it can't leave the ground floor. So I may have to use it more for shooting if this one isn't a good choice. And there are no objectives on half cubes. Well, actually, I suppose this one. Yeah, because it's a bit, that's kind of a half cube. So the juggernaut won't be able to go after that one because it's too large. So the juggernaut can go for those two though. The issue with that is that the Juggernaut, if it goes up there, there are some half cubes on all the corners, so there could be enemies there that I wouldn't be able to get my full fighting power against, because I wouldn't be able to enter the cube that they're in. So, for my setup in the bottom left, which is this area here, I've got my bike, I've got one Brocker, and I've got my General, the Forge Guard, Huskarl. In the other corner, on the opposite corner of the table, which is up here, I have got my Juggernaut. Uh, I actually found out later that this is an illegal deployment and that you're not allowed to put any vehicles off the ground floor in deployment. I thought that only applied to the, uh, the ones that ride around and can't leave the floor, but apparently it's all vehicles, so that's probably illegal there. In fact, it definitely is. Then we've got another forge guard under there and a brocket. There are windows under here somewhere, so they're not trapped in there. They'll be able to dive through the windows. This forge guard, despite being really beefy, they're only size one. Let's see, oh, we've got another comment. I made a carbon copy of your plague list, uh, so my girlfriend can keep on winning while I make up other lists. Copying my plague lists can't possibly be a bad idea because they seem to do quite well. Now, in this game, I'm up against the mighty enforcers. So we've got a sentry gun, we've got, I don't exactly know what everything is because they all look the same to me, but we've definitely got a burst laser there, we've got a dog drone, we've got an assault enforcer, you can see because he's got the knife on the end of his hand, we have got some pathfinders I think in there as well, and there is a, a really powerful AP weapon on one of the Enforcer troops as well, which I think is a thermal gun of some kind. It may, be, it may well be that guy there. And then this is another Assault Enforcer with a knife. So they are, there's some of them hiding under the building there, and there's a couple on the roof who obviously want to dive straight into this tower and get the extra dice for shooting at me from height. But the really good AP weapon is only range four, so it's not gonna be able to do much without moving out first. So my opponent does some scout moves and some recon test moves and gets this, I think this is a pathfinder, right up onto the top there so he's going to be able to start shooting down. And what I was saying about lines of sight on this mission, because you obviously have to watch out for multiple directions, so it's more complicated than usual protecting your units 
from firepower coming in at them. So, then, moving on, this Pathfinder Sniper. I think it's a Pathfinder Sniper. Climbs up, uh, to, right to the top of the tower, and the other one's actually gone inside the tower as well. And they're going to start blasting away, and this guy immediately kills Brocker. So they do tend to die as soon as someone shoots at them, even though they've got decent defense stat. Or survive stat, should I say. And uh, my opponent did have to use some of these command dice in order to facilitate that. Have I shown a picture of my command dice? Yeah, there we go. I've got some movement, which is good for the slow forge fathers, but no shoot dice, which is annoying. And the splat to reduce incoming AP. I really like using the brockers because I think I've done a nice paint job on them but they do tend to die quite easily. So I've moved a forge guard, this is in the top right of the table, I've just moved him into a position where he can't be shot by anything horrible, uh, which is down there. So he's sitting behind that solid wall. And then the thermal rifle decides it wants to take a nice shot at the juggernaut immediately, so it comes out of his hidey hole, blasts away, but does nothing, so that's good. The dog drone then pins my bike, bikes can be pinned, they just can't be scattered uh, for any frag or blast weaponry. They can be pinned, though. There's, they're like a semi-vehicle. Kind of a vehicle, kind of not a vehicle. So they obey some of the rules, but not others. So this is quite a big deal, because that's the main AP threat against my army, which has lots of armour. So the Juggernaut can probably go and kill that guy in a minute. And of course the Juggernaut and the Forge Guard cannot be pinned, because they're all solid. So it's no good suppressing them. The bike and the brockers are more susceptible to that. So I moved my leader, the forge guard Huskarl, up into this area. He's on the one point objective now, hiding a little bit behind this bit of terrain so no one's going to get a clear shot on him. If it was up to me, clear shots would either not exist in Dead Zone or be very much reworked. Because it's one thing I kind of don't like about the game. There are a few things, but I make many of these known to the rules committee. One of the things is that you're punished if you play too quickly. Because if you don't take your time to position a little bit of your base behind a bit of terrain in a cube, uh, then you will get open shot by something. And I would rather the game was faster by not forcing you to do that, I think. Anyway, it is in the game, so you've got to play by the rules. The engineer, so this is a, a, an enforcer engineer, He's popped out there and is hiding. And an assault enforcer finds a med pack, which may come in useful for him. And my bike stands up and then fires back at the enemy, but I don't think he kills anybody. I send my brocker out the window down into here. And we've got an assault enforcer on the one point objective now, so he's come from the bottom right of the table. And then the juggernaut assaults the thermal rifle. And I think it just does one wound and doesn't kill it. Or I may do no wounds at all, I can't see any wounds. But the Juggernaut does not kill it, but I am in the same cube as it, so breaking away from me would be very risky because I'd get a free slap at him. But you would expect the Juggernaut to just kill that guy in one go and then be free to act of his own free will next turn. But as it is, he's kind of stuck in there with him for now. Now, so that's the overview of the table at the end of the first round. I've only got one point for this objective. My opponent has two for killing a Brocker and... What was the other one? Oh yeah, this one. This objective that the Enforcer is standing on, the Assault Enforcer. Now, here's a dilemma for me. Because I have a Brocker down here, but he was shot by something from this area and was wounded. So, what I would have wanted to do with the Brocker is steam in there and kill the Enforcer that the Juggernaut is in there with. So I have an extra dice for having a friend in the cube. Because the Brockers are good in combat. Then the Brocker kills him, and then the Juggernaut's free to then activate to perhaps climb up here, kill the drone, and then set fire to these two guys, perhaps. That would be a good use of his time if I have a shoot dice. However, because the Brock has taken a wound, I think that actually, I probably wouldn't kill that guy. And I might actually get killed. I'm very unlucky. But probably won't kill him with that number of dice while wounded. So instead, I'm just going to play it safe and kill him with the Juggernaut instead. And then do slightly less with the Juggernaut afterwards. So we'll see if that's a good bit of reasoning or not. It's a very low scoring first round, but the egg does come into play now. The Easter egg appears there on the table in the top right, and it's going to go straight for my Brocker. 
So yeah, actually, when I say the Brocket got wounded, this is actually what does it. It wasn't at the end of the round, it was the Easter Egg. Climbs up onto the roof and then shoots him and does a wound. So that's why I decided not to send him into combat. However, the Easter Egg being here does present me with an opportunity to get three points. And I do have a Forge Guard down there who could go and attack the Easter Egg. So I've got Shoot Dice and I've got Move Dice. My opponent's got some Move Dice and a bit of Shoot as well. The Juggernaut kills the Enforcer that he was fighting earlier, which is nice, so he's dead. I've got some points for that. And then Flamed with the Flamethrower on the Juggernaut with a Shoot Dice into the top of this stack. So the Sniper is now suffering from the effects of being on fire. So when they activate, it's going to be dicey whether they live or die. Then, this burst laser pops across onto this platform here and open shots the bike from above, but doesn't manage to kill it. Pins it though, which means that I then have to stand up, use a short action to get here, and then use a move dice with the bike, I think. Actually, I don't know, because maybe I could just go into that cube there directly through the door. So I don't think I need a move dice. So I can still move two even while pinned with the bike. So one, two, into the assault enforcer, and bikes are very good in combat, so they fight on fours, they've got uh, smash one, which is good to get an extra dice, and the bike is bigger than an enforcer as well. So I managed to do a wound. And then they both get pinned, which is a result of the dog drone, who climbed up there and decided to pin both of them. Possibly with the intent to move the assault enforcer away without triggering a fight, or to move someone else in to attack the bike. However, my forge guard Huskarl, my leader, decides what would be a great use of my time is jump over to this platform and open shot the burst laser and then assault the dog drone. So he jumps over, open shots the burst laser, but only does one damage. And then rather than trying to shoot it again, I then just decide I'm going to kill that dog and kill the dog drone in close combat. And I'm not too concerned about leaving myself open there because I'm going to be going first in the next round because I've got less models than the enemy here. The Engineer pops up onto there and kills one of my Brockers, so I've lost both of them now. I don't even know if the other one was mentioned during this game. Both Brockers are down. So my Forge Guard that I talked about going after the Egg. I don't think I had the, the good combination of dice to climb up here and then open shot the Egg at this point, so I think I just had to assault it and did a wound. So hopefully I kill it before the end of the game and get the points. And that is how the battlefield is looking at the moment. The Assault Enforcer jumps on that one point objective. And then, when the... Whoever it was at the top of this tower, I'm not sure if it was a Pathfinder Sniper, tried to activate while on fire and died. So there we go. So who's picking up the points for this round? Oh, actually, you'll notice that... The Assault Enforcer that jumped away there, then left this cube open. So this guy then shot the bike, and the bike's dead. So I've lost all the Brocker units. I've only got my really tough armoured stuff now. But I do have a little bit, a tiny little lead here. So I picked up some good points that round. My opponent got a few as well. And going into the next round. So I'm going to be going first. I've got two shoot dice and an activation dice, which is generally the dream if you're going first, at least until my proposed changes to activation come in. At my tournaments, I don't allow people to use the activation dice with their first activation of each round. So that gives both players the opportunity to move out the way with something before it gets horribly gunned down multiple times at the start of each round. I also don't allow stun grenades at my event, by the way. If anyone picks up a stun grenade at my event from a crate, then they have to use it as a regular frag grenade, because I think stun grenades are bad for the game. My opponent has got a move dice, shooting dice, and some extra dice, dice, dice. So, my leader is going to jump back over here and try and kill the assault enforcer, but only does a wound. But I do kill the burst laser first with another open shot before I jump over there. So, good job from him. The juggernaut is now up here on a on an objective and setting fire to the other guy that's climbed up to the roof and takes he takes a wound from that as well. However, you may notice the Juggernaut is now dead. That's because the Engineer climbs up on here and takes an open shot, which 
was pretty unavoidable with the size of the Juggernaut's base. I'm not really going to fit it anywhere else and still be inside this cube. So I was more concerned about having an open shot at me from this direction, which this little tiny nugget of terrain here would have prevented, but I don't think I'm going to even fit it in there. So I couldn't have stopped it coming in from this way. And yeah, the engineer with no AP murders the Juggernaut by throwing in lots of extra dice into the shoot attack. So the Juggernaut's down, and I'm down to just my Forge Guard and the Huskarl. Speaking of the Forge Guard, another wound done to the Cream Egg. For anyone who's just joined this, by the way, and you wonder what's going on, this Easter-themed event has a, a random creature, a random construct, a random Dalek-like egg that appears somewhere on the battlefield and then attacks the nearest thing. And if you kill it, you then get victory points. And you also get victory points if you claim the egg. So if you kill it in close combat, you get more. If you shoot it down and someone else jumps on the egg, you'll have to share the victory points. So he's spending a good amount of time killing that, which means I've only got one model contesting objectives, which is not ideal, especially since the enemy start to leap onto them at the end of that round. So you can see that the enemy are spreading out onto all the objectives now. And at the end of that round, the evil enforcers make a bit of a comeback now and have a good scoring round there since I'm running out of models rapidly. Now, I've got move dice and loads of fight dice, which isn't great, but I can't re-roll them because I'm below half strength of my strike team now. However, the Forge Guard does kill the Easter Egg, which gives me another three juicy points, so that's going to be big. And I also get a cream egg as well. Then, my leader kills the Assault Enforcer that he was in a cube with, and then attacks this uh, Pathfinder in the other cube. And so, because my Forge Guard killed the Easter Egg in its own activation, because the Easter Egg activates first and tries to kill if it's in an occupied cube, so I was able to kill it by fighting back against it. Which means that this guy hasn't activated yet, so he can still do something useful. And what happened was, the engineer jumped from this objective over here so he could get a shot at my forge guard which meant that the forge guard then jumped over here after surviving the shot jumped up here and murdered the engineer so loads of dead enforcers and you can see here that i think this one tried to maybe break away from my huskarl and then got killed so look at that, a big scoring round four for me. The Enforcers have a disaster of a round and that is an 18-3 win for the Forge Fathers. So it's first to 16. It's obviously a very close game and being able to kill the Easter Egg with him was obviously important. Although, of course, if the Egg hadn't come in, he would have been able to actually contribute and maybe killed some of the enemy. So it's that could divide opinion on whether the Easter Egg coming in was a benefit or not. Of course, I got the points, but he spent this whole game fighting it. I was kind of one very expensive model down for the whole fight. But the two heavily armoured forge guard units survive the game, which is nice. That's what they're there to do. Live and not die, ideally. And on to the next round. So, here's the terrain layout for game two. So even though this is a big landing platform on the top, there is actually a lot of line of sight underneath it, which will be visible in the next photo. There you go. You can see right through to a lot of it. And I'm up against the filthy, disgusting plague on Divide and Conquer. And this is one... I've got mixed feelings on this one, because for my strike team, having to contest both sides of the table isn't that great because they're so slow. On the other hand, I do have a couple of tough things that I could throw in each direction. It's not like I only have one unit that's a threat. I've got three really good armoured units and one pretty tough all-round fast unit. So I can potentially contest two sides. So it's not the worst. And here's my setup. So I've got the Juggernaut under there. I've got three models in a cube, which should say to you that I'm not facing any suppression weaponry at long range and I'm not facing any mortars for example because I wouldn't put multiple models in the same cube under those circumstances and I've got a Brocker and my Huskarl up on top there so what am I up against? Well I'm up against the Plague Sentient who is pretty good at fighting but his splat allows these aberrations to ignore 
having to take a rampage test and just auto pass it basically for a splat which is really good and there's two aberrations which are significantly better at fighting than anything I've got but the one downside to aberrations is that they're not solid whereas a lot of my stuff is so if I can get them pinned and then assault them then they're nowhere near as potent because they won't be able to use their smash which they only get during fights and they won't be able to use their fight stat which is on a 3 plus they would have to survive instead so they're much worse when they're pinned so if I can pin them that's the game plan there are two of them though so one of them can conceivably go for each side which is kind of terrifying because there's nowhere I can be safe from them while also scoring points there are two flamers in there as well so setting fire to a juggernaut is potentially a good way of stopping them doing anything because they only survive on fives so they're quite likely to fail the flame test when they're on fire and I also keep pitching to the rules committee to make changes to the fire mechanic but I don't know if that's falling on deaf ears or not and then there are four zombies so the zombie is not really a threat to any of my stuff so I'm not concerned about them so much but obviously two aberrations very scary so immediately you'll see that there are three objectives on ground level which is good news for the bike because you can actually access them and one on the very top of a tower and before the game we decide that big models can just climb up there so whether that means there are hatches that are big enough or whether they can climb up to one level and then kind of scale the outside with their movement of two to get to the top either way we decide that big stuff can climb up this tower that doesn't have any connecting platforms just because uh, we want to clear that up before the game and we've both got units that could benefit from that so that's what we decide to play it as if you're ever in a situation like that where it's unclear whether certain units would have access to an area just discuss it before the game so that you don't have any weird situations in the middle of the game where you're both arguing from a different side and maybe one of you is playing with it in mind and then they found out that that's not actually how you intended it to be played so discuss these things beforehand same with any cubes that have a piece missing decide which ones are half cubes and which ones are full cubes very important to decide which units can access them and there's a bit of a cinematic shot of my strike team I like how the white paintwork on these guys came out with the little the little bits of green and orange in there As you can see I think that's one of the aberrations through there possibly or it could be him actually it could be the sentient so my command dice for the first round some movement and some shooting so that's good that's what you want really in the first round you want to be able to reach objectives and shoot at stuff my opponent has some splats so we'll be able to ignore rampaging if I wound the aberrations before they can move and activation and extra dice so a less impressive selection there I think for the first round so the sentient jumps immediately up onto the two point objective on the top of the tower but he's really only going to score there because I don't think he has any ability to shoot the jank master says if only he had teratons yes teratons would be very handy for this not just for this game but also just against my strike team in general they're quite good at taking down things that are smaller than them they don't have their ideal target in my list because i always say that the perfect snack for a teraton is a forge father steel warrior because you're paying a lot of points to have armor that the teraton will ignore and it's bigger and it's much faster so teratons very much like snacking on steel warriors we've got bad squiddo games in the chat delicious egg Yes, delicious eggs were available at this tournament. Not only can you win the cream egg during each game, but there are also large Easter eggs available as the trophies slash prizes for the event as well. So, phase one of my plan into operation. Forge Guard Huskarl moves up to the top here. And, oh yeah, one of the aberrations immediately went onto this objective as well. And... I've got mixed feelings on this on the one hand if you don't send the aberration on there immediately you risk them being shot and pinned from a distance which means they're stuck at the back and then they have reduced movement when moving forward on the other hand if you get to an objective first the enemy get extra dice for moving into combat with you but you're an aberration so maybe people wouldn't want to do that but i've got my huskarl up there and I decide to rapid fire into the aberration so I'm not trying to do damage I just want to pin it with the rapid fire so the aberration is now pinned <clears throat> phase two of the plan when it comes to that is going to be to send the juggernaut in there 
to assault the aberration while it's down, because that's your one chance to really kill that thing. Then I've got my regular forge guard moving over to the right. And you can see that an aberration has moved up here onto this side as well. And there is a flamer that's jumped onto one of the two-point objectives on the right-hand side as well. What's this? A Juggernaut kills an Aberration in one round of close combat. That is correct. The Juggernaut steams in there. So fighting against a pinned Aberration while moving in. And with a Frenzy 1 on the drill. With AP on the drill as well to get through the armour of the Aberration. Managed to roll very successfully and kill it immediately. So that is a really big deal in the game. That's a large amount of points murdered very early on. And it poses next to the cream egg that hasn't come into play yet. However, one of the flamers then does set my juggernaut on fire. So he might be stuck there for the game now. But I don't mind being on fire if I'm in this cube. Because I can still score and nothing is shifting me from that unless they come to fight me. Then... I've tried the same trick on this aberration. So this forge guard pinned this aberration here with a rapid fire move. And then the brooker on the bike decided that he was going to try the same maneuver that the juggernaut did and steam in there and try and murder a prone pinned aberration with some good amounts of dice because he's got smash on the bike as well. So that gives you an extra dice and it's pinned. Unfortunately, wasn't as successful as the juggernaut and that combat will rage on. It looks like I just did one wound there, so it didn't quite kill it. Then, some zombies start making the very slow shamble forwards from the back there. They're not going to get involved particularly yet. And my Brocker, from the right-hand side, moves into the Flamer on this two-point objective. I could have just rested here and got two points, but my opponent also would have got two, so I thought I'll try and kill him. I do a wound anyway, so that's a good start. And it's going to be difficult for him to get away from me now while wounded, because he would probably get killed during the breakaway attempt, so he's mostly stuck there unless he gets some assistance. And the Aberration can't assist because it's too big, so it can't go into a cube that has that many models in. And I think that is the end of the round, pretty much. I think my Brocker on the left-hand side just pops out of his hidey hole and does a bit of shooting, but nothing to write home about there. So, good first round, solid round, killed an Aberration. Can't do much better than that in the first round. Next round, shoot dice and a sprinkling of other things, activation and fight. My opponent has a bit of shooting, which isn't that much use. Obviously, there's a flamer in there, so it can be used, but it's not as amazing as it could be. Move dice always good for the plague. You want to be fighting things. The egg enters play and it kills one of the zombies. It shoots one of them and then it moves straight into combat with them. But because they have horde, they get a load of dice to fight it with. And they actually do two wounds to the egg, so it's only got one wound left. So if they, if any of those zombies get a chance to activate, they will definitely kill this egg, I think. Because it'll fight, but it mimics the fight stat of whoever it's fighting. So it's not very good at fighting while it's fighting zombies. And they will have a lot more dice. So I have a plan now. My plan is to kill the egg. If I can shoot the egg, then the enemy will still collect it to get one of the victory points. But I would rather I get two points and my opponent gets one because if I let them just kill the egg then they would get three points for killing it and claiming the egg as well so I'm going to try and shoot the egg down really early in this turn to stop them being able to do that so my Huskarl who is high up and shooting on a three plus because he's just good at shooting that's his thing he kills the egg so I get two victory points and then that one victory point is now left there for a zombie to collect in a minute so considering where the egg landed I think that was a good outcome for me there would obviously be better if it landed like right behind me, didn't kill me, and then I can just shoot it without a, without the enemy going to collect the egg for one of the VPs. Uh, the Juggernaut being on fire means that he spends the turn putting out the flames, unfortunately, <coughs> and fails the test, so isn't able to do anything, but he's okay with that because he's on a two-point objective. The Flamer and the Zombies, you can see them amassed down there, my regular forge guard so why has he moved up onto the roof so the aberration is fighting my bike and let's see i'm gonna go back and have a look at the enemy command dice so what i don't want to happen i don't think it's possible now but a general goal 
when you're against a big scary monster like this is don't let it chain together kills. So if they had a move dice for example, what they could do is fight the bike, kill it, and then use a move dice to reach this guy. So you don't want your models too close together when the enemy have a big meaty monster in there. Now if there was a fight dice available, that fight dice can be used to perform the fight and then kill it, and then you could do a full move after that, so you could go even further. So you've got to watch the spacing between your models when you're fighting something big and meaty. So, the aberration does kill the bike this time, and my Brocker then kills the flamer that he was fighting last time, and is quite happy on this objective now. And the aberration is stuck not on an objective. My Brocker uh, moves up here and shoots with his pistol at the flamer and does a single wound. And another good solid scoring round for me, the Plague have a decent round that time. So even though I've in extended my lead that turn, the Plague are now starting to score a bit. And this turn I've got a load of shoot dice. I don't even know if I can use that many, but we're going to try. And my opponent has got really the only really valuable one is that move dice. So with the move dice that increases your chances of being able to fight multiple times with, for example, a Terraton. So, not a Terraton, an Aberration should I say. So I've got my handy dandy Juggernaut able to not be on fire this time and fires a nice burst of flame up there at the Sentient and also kills a zombie I think with the Flamer as well. So I used a shoot dice to kill a zombie and shoot up there. And I'm just sitting pretty on the objective. Then, the Aberration attacks my Brocker. And you would think he's just going to eat that Brocker for breakfast, but no, the Brocker actually survives. I was helped by the fact that it had a wound on it, and it used a splat, I think, to avoid the effects of Rampage this turn, or to auto-pass the test. And because the Aberration didn't kill the Brocker, I then felt like... This is this is kind of safe now. So my Forge Guard moves on to the two-point objective. Down here, my other Brocker moves up and opens up some crates. And I find a stun grenade, but I throw it away. Because I've also found an adrenaline shot, which gives you an extra bit of speed when you use it. So I, well, I would like a stun grenade. That's quite a powerful weapon, even though I don't think it should exist in Dead Zone. But that's another topic for another day. But what I want is this, because it's going to allow me next turn to climb right to the top of the tower with this guy and get into a fight, so that would be nice. Although, not even into a fight anymore, because the Sentient jumped down to fight the Juggernaut, but didn't do anything. So I can go up unopposed, maybe, into that cube on the top. And there's only a wounded Flamer up there, so if I can assault him, I would almost certainly kill him with this Brocker. So it's going quite smoothly for the Forge Fathers still. A zombie has a go at killing the Brocker and does actually do a wound to him, which isn't very friendly. And... Oh no, he doesn't do a wound. I put a wound down initially and then remembered, oh wait, I've got a uh, Resilient. And... No, wait, that's not what happened. No, I remember. It's not Resilient. It's the bike that is Resilient. So the Brocker... Because I had one dice left and it was about to be the end of the turn, I realised, oh yeah, I'll just use that for a re-roll, because there's nothing else to use it on. So I used it for a re-roll and got another success, and then didn't get a wound because of that. There is an incident somewhere in the tournament where I forgot that I had Resilient on the bike, and was, was going to take it off as a casualty, and then remembered, oh actually I've got Resilient, and then rolled, and then saved it that way, but that's a different incident. So, low scoring round three, I'm still poised to reach 16 this round, as you can see there, I don't need a lot of points at all. I'm already on 15, and my opponent's only on 9, so I just need one more point and stop my opponent scoring 7. So, with that in mind, what am I going to do from this position? I do not want the Aberration to kill these two. Uh, that would be a good start for him, because he'd get 1, 3 there, and then 2 for being on this objective at the end. So, that would be enough to reach 16, killing those two and being on the on the scoring area. So we can't let that happen, so I need to do something about that, ideally. I also need to score a point myself, so I'm going to try and get this guy up onto the roof to fight the Flamer. Or just shoot as well with this, with my Huskarl. So let's see what I do. I 
I think I pinned this guy. Uh, the sentient. Then the aberration strikes, and it kills the Brocker, but only at the second attempt, and it had to use a fight dice to do it. Which means that he's now used long action and a dice, so he can't then use a move dice, for example, to get in here. He's got no move to get there. So this bit is safe. And even if it wasn't, the Forge Guard moves a little bit and just shoots the Aberration and kills it. So there you go. The Juggernaut then murders the Sentient, which is fun times for all. And you'll see that my Brocker, he did actually manage to kill or get away from the zombie. Made it up to the roof, but then the Flamer killed him. So, final score, 25 to the Forge Fathers, 13 for the Plague, so a nice juicy win. Now, this result should have been a bit closer, score-wise, but my opponent, upon realising that he needed to score points to try and salvage a draw, was kind of throwing models into combat towards the end of the game, so things were getting killed. So that helped me score more points. On to the next round. And it is Chemchase. Do I think this is a good scenario for me? Not at all, because the... Well, it could be. If I get very lucky, it could be good for me. Because the objectives move to a random location at the start of each round, that means that my very slow strike team could possibly have to go from one end of the table to the other in one go and then back again. But I can't rely on being able to score objectives. I do have the bike though, but as you'll see from the layout of the map in a minute, then most of the places where at least one of the objectives will end up are above ground, so the bike can't get to them. So deploying all the way along the back line. So on the right flank, we've got my leader, the Forge Guard Huskarl, we've got the Juggernauts, and the reason they're hiding in this corner is because there's good blockage to the enemy, and you'll see why in a minute. I've got my regular Forge Guard here, bike out on the left, and I've got a Brocker under this building here and another one down there. I'm up against, this is the top left of the opponent's area. There is, this is the Rebs, by the way. There is a Grogan with an AP3 weapon. So he is actually quite scary. That's the one thing that will punch straight through my armour, and also it means that if I have a splat result, it's pointless spending it to lower the AP, because I'd only be lowering it to AP2, so it's still ignoring my armour. So unless I have two splat results, then I can't negatively affect this guy's AP. There is the rebel leader there. There are some Sorak. So there are two regular Sorak with the blast weapons that just blast you away and don't hurt you, and then there are two Sorak Swordmasters, who are pretty good in close combat. Then there are two Rebel Terratons, which are obviously quite terrifying. And there is a Craw. So the Craw has been armed with a stun grenade, which means that he can do aerial deployment. So if the Rebs go first, he can aerial deploy near my lines and then immediately throw a stun grenade at the biggest threatening unit and very likely to make them activated for the round. So hold them in place. So this is why I don't think stun grenades should exist. But I don't think the fun value of them I think that is so... The negative effect on fun, I would say, is far greater than the tactical depth that you gain from them existing. So I would just completely write them out of the game, and I do ban them from my own tournaments. So... Uh, this guy's also... With the aerial deployment, you can drop down anywhere, except in the enemy deployment zone. So if you know you're going first, you can deploy really close to them. So here are my command dice, some nice shooting and activation, a bit of fighting, probably not much good in the first round. And my opponent's got some fighty, which is really not that great in the first round either, and some movement. Movement is good for Terratons because then you've potentially got four cubes of movement you can make with a teleport. And so there's the overview of the battlefield. The Craw has come down right here, I think. So it's going to be able to throw its grenade. You might recognise this table from game one. That's because I was recycled back onto this table. And I did set my stuff up on this side. But my opponent won the recontest and chose that side. Probably because it's got a tower to put the Grogan in. So. It's going to be interesting. Do I have a plan? Well, it depends where the objectives are. If they wildly spread out and I'm nowhere near them. I'm not sure... 
I could just fully commit and go after killing the things that I think are a threat, like the AP3 Grogan. But if I do that, I'm not going after objectives. And I'm also in fully in its line of sight to be shot while walking towards it. The Grogan is quite happy up there because it doesn't have to contest objectives because there are Terratons. I don't really have the luxury of perching someone up here for the whole game and their only contribution is shooting because I don't have enough models. So if a couple of them get shot down, whoever's up here would actually have to go down there and engage the enemy. Whereas my opponent's got a lot more disposable stuff that can be flung onto objectives without affecting the overall strategy. So, the Juggernaut has a stun grenade thrown at it, so that's activated for the round, so it can't do anything. The Rebel Leader pops up and shoots a wound onto the bike. My regular Forge Guard jumps up and I think, you know what, this Grogan is a big threat. It's done loads of damage to me in practice games. So I jump up on the roof and blast away at it, but do nothing. It then climbs up to the roof, fires back, and kills the Forge Guard in one go. Yeah, so that's my experience of fighting against this guy so far. Taking shots at him, not killing him. Now on average, I'm probably not going to kill him in one shot. Because he's survived four and he's got resilient one. He doesn't have any armour. But on average, he's going to get a few survive successes. So you're not expecting to kill him with every shot. But I would also not necessarily expect a forged guard to instantly die to him either. He is ignoring my armour, but I do survive on fours. So he is a good choice for taking down those kinds of units. So my bike then moves into the middle, but becomes pinned from being shot by something else. I've moved my Brooker up slightly, and you can see a Terraton is hiding under this platform in the middle, ready to strike. And another Terraton is on the two-point objective there. Now, oh yeah, I didn't really point out where the objectives landed, did I? So one of them is clearly here, and the other one is... I got a picture of it. Is it in the overhead view? One there and one there, there you go. So that's where they started in the first round. And there's a Terraton on one of them. But I'm going to be going first in the next round, so I can try my old tried and trusted trick of maybe pinning the Terraton with something and then assaulting it, assuming I've got a move dice with the Juggernaut. So that's going to be my plan if I get an activation dice as well. So here we go. Two activation dice and the move dice and the shoot dice. So that's a perfect combo for doing this manoeuvre now. And my opponent has got some splats which are used to reverse the stats of an active model so if you're shooting with a Grogan, for example, you can change your shoot stats to your survive stat and make it shoot on fours. So a splat is a very good way to fuel that model into shooting effectively. The egg comes into play though, and it takes a shot at my bike, I think. Or I think it might go for this guy, actually. It's Brocker. So it's making its way forward. And my bike decides to assault the egg, because my bike, who was pinned at the end of the last round, realises there's nothing worth fighting over here, because the Terraton is about to get attacked by my Juggernaut. So, I decide, actually, what I'm going to do is... I think, actually, I might pin it with the bike first, and then assault the egg. So you're getting good value out of that. So I have to stand up from being pinned. I think I was pinned, and then use a shoot dice to shoot the Terraton and then make a one cube move into attack the egg. And I've got a Brocker hiding behind this wall. Uh, so, what actually happened, let me just wind back a bit. So this Terraton that I was planning to assault, I actually realized, you know what, if I move my leader to the edge of this building, I can actually get an open shot on him from up there with AP1 and shooting on threes. So I try that instead and kill the Terraton. So this is actually the second Terraton here, which assaults the Brocker underneath. So he's on the roof for photo purposes, but with one Terraton down, the other one comes from over here and teleports through the wall into there. Now my opponent at this stage informed me that he'd forgotten or just didn't realize the Juggernaut was not size four and it's actually size three, which means that if I climb over there, I can get in through the door. So he thought he was blocked off safe from the Juggernaut. Now, 
it is a bit of a point of contention, the size of the Juggernauts, because it's three, but clearly it's massive. It's bigger than most size four models in the game, it's much bigger than the Iron Ancestor, which is size four. So I feel like the rules team and the design team obviously didn't put their heads together on that one. And it should be size four, but it's only size three. So maybe you would have to amend the other rules for it slightly to uh, to factor the size into it. But it should be done because it, it's a massive, look at it. How are you supposed to fit anything else with that? Especially if an Iron Ancestor is size four, this should be as well. So he can, with a move dice, go one, two, three, into that cube underneath, which is where the Terraton is. And the Terraton that went into the Brocker didn't kill it either, so I'm going to have a friend in the cube as well. Uh, which leads to another Brocker death, because the Juggernaut steams in there and murders it. Uh, then move one of my Brockers forward. Actually, he gets blasted forward and scatters into this location here, so he's pinned, which is what that's representing. However, I do then jump up and climb up into here and kill that Sorak. And I'm now on the two-point objective, and I have a shock baton, which I think I used in the combat, so that gets taken away. So, yeah, that's turned it a little bit, killing both those Terratons like that. And suddenly it's looking quite healthy. We've got a human hand in action there. And a Sorak Swordmaster jumps up and kills the Brocker that was on the objective, so trading a bit there. And this Brocker shoots and rapid fires because the Brocker pistols do have rapid fire. So I decide I'm going to pin this Swordmaster and stop him reaching this objective this turn because he's not fast enough when he's pinned. So I successfully pin him and now he can't reach this. So into the next round, I don't think I took a picture of the scores there, but it's pretty damn close because I've killed two Terratons. And we'll see where the, what the Easter egg does with the bike, and we'll see where the objectives go in this round as well, because that's going to determine a lot. If the objectives land right here, that's great for me, because I can just jump guys straight onto them. They're all the way over there. That's very bad for me. So I've got move dice and fight dice, which is okay for now, because that's kind of where we're at in the game, but I'd rather have some shooting. And my opponent has splats and a little bit of move and lots of fight as well. So, the egg in its activation kills the bike. So the bike who is actually good at fighting, but goes down to the egg, so that just gives my opponent two points. So the Easter egg not doing me any favours in this game. Then you'll see that my Juggernaut climbed up here and set the Swordmaster on fire. And he's quite happily hanging out up there. And then this Brocker down here becomes pinned by something, probably a Sorak. But my Huskarl climbs up onto the roof and open shots the model that was in here, which I think was... was that a Swordmaster? Yes it was. So climbing up there to get an open shot, blast away, kill it, and I'm on a two-point objective. So my leader is now in a good position, can't be open shot from anywhere. And we've got some good kills racked up here against the Rebs. And then another change of round. Oh, there's the scores now at the end of round three. So I've I pulled it back in round two, and then round three continued, scoring solidly, but it's still very close, still close scoring. And for this round, I've got movement, shooting, and my opponent has got lots of extra dice, which are immediately thrown into a shoot action with the Grogan, who guns down my leader with those three extra dice. So, it, what I was talking about after the game with some of the other players is that in this game, it's not so much about looking at the base stat, it's how many dice can you get. Because if, you've, if you are hitting or surviving on twos, you still only have three dice. So on average, you probably won't get an eight with three dice. So you'll probably get three successes if you've got a really good stat. If your opponent is then able to throw eight dice at something, they have a very good chance of beating you. If they're only throwing three dice, then they may, may well get three successes as well. But that's not going to be enough to do anything to you, so it's all about amassing dice. It doesn't matter if you're successful, if your opponent is also successful with a small number of dice, then not much is going to be accomplished. You need to amass those dice, so if you get to high ground, you get the bonuses for moving into combat, things like smash, having extra size, and ammo for shooting, and if you can get clear shots then great, and extra dice results on the command dice, 
and then using your re-rolls wisely as well, then a huge amount of dice kills this guy, and I'm down to two models now. And one of them's a Brocker who's wounded by the egg. So that's not ideal. But I do have my Juggernaut on a two-point objective. And that's cool. So the Rebs claw it back a bit there and swing the momentum their way slightly again. So at the moment, I am sitting pretty on 14 points. And my opponent is on 15 points. So my opponent needs one more point to reach 16. I need two. So this is the state of play here. So, if I stay on this two-point objective, well, actually, the objectives are going to move, so let's not even talk about it until we see where they've gone. So, they've moved. One is up here, which the Juggernaut can't access. The other one is down here. So, my fiendish plan, because the egg uh, goes after the Brocker, so that the objective is in the cube with the Brocker and the egg. So, what's my plan? And why is it flawed? So, because of the positioning of the terrain here, I don't know if this guy maybe got nudged or something, so he was slightly more into this cube than I originally wanted. But, in my mind, he was in this cube at this point. So, I decided to shoot with him. And I think I set fire to someone. But, that means that I can now no longer get to this objective. Because I've got a move dice. So I was just going to shoot and then go one and then jump down and fight the egg and get all the points for killing the egg and be on a two point objective. But because I fired first, because I misjudged which cube I was in or just forgot which cube I was in, now the best I can do is move one and then a move dice to here because I don't have any shoot dice so I can't shoot again. So the juggernaut has probably cost me either a win or a draw from this point onwards based on that because I just forgot which cube he was in, which is pretty hilarious. And of course there was this incident earlier where my opponent misjudged the size of the Juggernaut as well and thought he was inaccessible to him. So a couple of Juggernaut based mistakes in this game, one on each side. And yeah, this is going to be tricky now because my Brock is going to get shot off by something and does, and that's the one point that was required for the win. So there you go. If the Juggernaut had been able to get down there because I hadn't incorrectly figured which cube he was in, then almost certainly would have killed the egg and got a load of points, which would have been at, at worst a draw then. And if the Brocker still dies, it would have been a draw, which is obviously better than a loss, but it's very close. And the way this tournament is scored, uh, you add your victory points onto your points total. So Getting a big amount of points in a loss is still a good way to go. Very unfortunate though with that final me forgetting which cube I was in incident. So on to the next game and it's strength in depth. So this one I think is really bad for me because there are three scoring areas. Two of them are obviously bigger but the one in the middle has a benefit to it as well because if you hold one of those in the next round you can re-roll a dice on a survive test. So three important areas. I do not have enough models really to fight effectively over all of them. Especially if I lose one model, I'm suddenly then really limited. So if I'm up against anyone that's got lots of models, I think this is gonna be really bad news. The, on the better side of it though, you can't uh, draw line of sight beyond four cubes in the first round. So less chance of being shot at in the first round, so that's good. And I'm up against... Oh, well, there's my deployment. I've got a Juggernaut there, Brocker. My leader is there, ready to jump up on here maybe and start blasting away. Brocker, Forge Guard, and the bike. So who am I up against? I'm up against the Rebs again. So, we were given the opportunity to protest having to play each other twice in a row because we're, we were on the top table and we're still the top table now. So, I think we both had the same mindset there. We didn't discuss why we made the decision to play each other again, but I think we both pretty much have the same thought in that. It's also someone I've played quite a bit recently as well. So in an ideal world, you don't want to be playing against the same person twice, especially if it's one of your regular opponents. 
but we're on the top table. So obviously our lists are good, we've been doing well, we've had successful games. And if we neglected, or if we chose not to play against each other, which probably would have been an option if we'd protested, then we would have been up against people further down the table. And is that... Do they deserve to have the top table lists and players thrust on them? Maybe some of them do, but there's a chance that you'd end up against someone who maybe is being unfairly punished by putting them against one of the top two in the final round. So that's why I was quite happy to play the same at the same matchup again. You don't want to punish the players lower down just so you can have a more fun experience of not playing the same person twice. I think it's fair this way. A lot of tournaments, they do say that in the last round, repeat matchups can happen. But I think in this event, we would have had the option of switching, but I don't think either of us wanted to for that reason, because we were the top table. So, it's the same list again. So, Terratons, Sorak, Grogan, the Grogan of Doom, and the Craw with the Stun Grenade. However, I win the recontest this time, which means I'm not going to get stunned into oblivion before I can do anything. So, I also am able to move my bike one cube from the recon result as well, which is nice. And there's my command dice, so I've got a bit of movement. What I can do, actually, in the first round is get my bike onto a two-point objective, possibly, if I think that's wise. And I've got Brocker under there. So first things first, the Juggernaut pops up and sets fire to the Craw. Doesn't kill it, but sets fire to it, so that's nice. The Grogan then jumps up and starts taking pot shots out the window and kills my forge guard immediately. So obviously I didn't need to deploy that close to the enemy. And yeah, because there's a four inch a four cube limit on shooting in the first round. But maybe I was overconfident. And the forge guard is just killed immediately by the Grogan. I even though I threw in quite a few command dice, I think. Let's see, what did I do? So I threw in both my command dice for shoot for extra dice to try and survive it, but it wasn't enough. So he's dead. My leader then jumps up onto the top and shoots down at the Grogan, but does nothing with the rest of my command dice. Despite shooting on threes, like I said, just having a good stat isn't always enough. When your opponent also has a decent stat, you really need extra dice. So that's a fail. My bike gets pinned, I think, by something. But I think he shoots at the Grogan, actually. Yes, yeah, so the bike got pinned. I decide instead of unpinning myself and moving away two cubes, I'm going to have another go at shooting the Grogan up through the window. It's wounded now. But that's about it. Enemy Terraton onto the objective, since it's now open. And then uses its flamethrower with a shoot dice. Once per game, flame into this cube with the Juggernaut and my Huskarl. And when the Craw tries to activate with its stun grenade, it dies because it was on fire. So there's a good moment. So I'll get a point for that. And another Terraton is just poised to strike. And there's the state of play at the end of the first round. So 3-1 to the Rebs at the moment in the rematch of the century. And what's my plan? Because I am going first. What I would like to do is activate... Well, I want an activation dice. I want a shoot dice, probably. And maybe a move dice as well. So what I want to do is go first, shoot and finish off the Grogan with my Huskarl, because he's wounded. So I've got a good chance of doing a wound there and finishing him off. Then I could then use a shoot dice and maybe pin the Terraton. And then maybe go after it with the Juggernaut, potentially. I might actually need a move dice to reach it because I can jump off the roof down to there. And where can I actually climb up though? Where is there a wall I can climb? Because all this bridge is kind of hollow underneath, so I don't know. I would have to study it carefully here, because I don't think there's actually any supports or walls under here to climb up. So I might just have to settle on shooting things. And then the bike, you can see its path here, because there's a, a doorway that it can go through and reach this two-point objective. So that's really the place I want it to be, but I can't prioritise that because these two are so important. They need to be 
hitting things now before they get to fire again. So I want to kill that Grogan before it gets the chance to take another shot. So. Sorak in position. Grogan does not get killed by my shooting. And... Well, spoiler alert. Three extra dice. My opponent has one. I throw all of them in with my shooting. Oh, we've got the egg first. Can't forget about the egg. So the egg comes in here. The Easter egg that's going to attack something. A randomly positioned on the table. It appears here. Drops down and shoots at my bike. Then... My leader, my Huskarl, shoots on threes with three extra dice from up here, shoots across to the Grogan, and does nothing because of that. That is the Grogan's survive roll, which I, I thought I should probably take a picture of. Wah, wah, wow. So lots of exploding eights came in there, and I've used an awful lot of command dice trying to kill the Grogan, and an awful lot of command dice trying to survive against the Grogan, and none of those things were successful. So that is... It's looking like game over already at this point, based on that alone. The Terraton kills my bike, which is not nice of him, and then uses a move dice to go and get into the cube with the Brocker as well, but doesn't kill him. Then my Juggernaut jumps off the roof. Let's see where it was. He's up here. So the Juggernaut jumps down there, then to there, and then assaults the Terraton who's under this area here. Now, we did have to check on the ability of solid models jumping off towers, because obviously he wouldn't be pinned when he lands because he's solid, so he can't be pinned, but he can potentially take fall damage. So you'll do the test to see if he takes fall damage, and if not, he just carries on as normal. So one cube of move gets you right down there. So it steams in. I've got a friend in the cube, and I'm moving in, and I've got Frenzy, but I still managed to take some wounds. I took one wound, actually. It might have been shooting from the Easter egg. Yeah, the egg might have shot him instead. And then I took two wounds in combat. Another Terraton goes after my, after my leader at the top of the tower. Now the Juggernaut bodyguard has departed. And doesn't do much, though. I'm sending a Brocker over in this direction, taking a shot at the Sorak. Another one jumps onto a one-point objective in the middle. Uh, the Sorak Swordmaster jumps onto this objective. I didn't want to get in his range, so I didn't want to jump onto this one and get stabbed to death. And then I take pictures at the end of the round where the Rebs are extending their lead, but then I realise, actually, my opponent has one model left who jumps up and kills the Brocker. So that's the real score. So as you can see, not going very well. And I've put all my resources into killing one model who is not dead. So the Grogan is still in there. So I get more dice, and okay, the Easter egg. The Easter egg that's been the bane of my existence in the final two games of this event. So from above, it clear shots the Juggernaut who is under here. So we determine, after consulting some other players as well on exactly how this works, if any part of your model or the base, uh, I think it's if it's within the cylinder of the base, and see the entirety of an enemy model, then you get a clear shot. So from above, there is a hole in the floor, so this part of the base, theoretically, can see almost everything except to, like, right up in the ceiling in this corner. And the Juggernaut would have actually been here if it would physically fit down there. So, yeah, we decide that probably should be an open shot because it's looking through a gap in the ceiling. So it kills the Juggernaut. So the Easter Egg has definitely sealed my fate, unfortunately, now. And there's no way I can deny my opponent the points to win at this stage. The Easter Egg then jumps down there and assaults the Terraton, I think, but doesn't kill it. The other Terraton kills my leader on the roof. And that's how the game is pretty much going to end right there. Look at that. So a final overview of the battlefield. Yeah, there you go. Wow, wow, wow. I think actually there should have been, some of these points maybe should have been on to, there have been around five? I don't think so. No, because that would have ended the game right there, wouldn't it? 
So I think they're just, I took a picture and then there were more points scored after that as well. So, final overview, because I think I might have still had a Brocka under there. This was quite a tough matchup, I think. This mission isn't great for my strike team, having to spread out across everywhere to pick things up. I could have obviously deployed further back and waited for the the fog to dissipate before moving into shooting range, and I gave the Grogan a chance to shoot me from this tower. However, the Easter Egg did kill one of my models, my most expensive, or one of my most expensive models. I also failed with some really, really favourable dice rolls against the Grogan. Uh, which may not have won the game, but it would have been a moral victory to kill that thing after it was the the curse, the, the dagger in me throughout this event. Two games in a row against this strike team. The, the previous game obviously was very, very close and very tense and exciting. This one slightly less so, because obviously there was that little bit of a positioning issue where I allowed myself to be shot. And outside of that, I think my dice kind of abandoned me in this one, which made it way more one-sided than the previous game. I still think this enemy list is fairly tough anyway. If you can't shoot down the Grogan, his AP is going to be a constant bane to the other units because he can just hang out in a tower the whole game, because the Terratons and the Sorak are good at clearing objectives and taking those. Sorak can blast people off them, the Terratons can either fight them or jump to a different objective, so the Grogan can just happily chill out up in a tower and just shoot anybody that dares step on an objective. So, what I'm thinking that I should have done differently, perhaps, rather than prioritising trying to kill that guy, because unless I throw lots of dice in, which I did later, but early on I had some shots at him that didn't have that many dice. So instead of trying to do that, I could have moved my bike immediately before it died onto this objective down here. And then at least if a Terraton goes over there to fight him, he's further away from the action. So that could have been a thing. What else could I have done differently? I don't know, I think this is a, quite a tricky list for me to deal with. In the first game, I think I did a good job. Obviously killing the Terratons was nice. But all in all, I think this this Reb Force is quite a tough one. Even though, on paper you look at it and you think, well there are blast weapons in there and half your stuff's solid. But they still get to use those blasts because not everything's solid. And there's not that much AP in there. But the one source of AP doesn't have to get close to me to use it, which is quite a big deal. Right, I'm going to wrap this one up in a second, folks. So thoughts on my Forge Fathers list. Let's bring up the thumbnail here. So overall, only six models is obviously not enough, not enough really for an ideal Dead Zone Strike team. The Juggernaut did a pretty good job throughout, he's pretty cool. The Forge Guard Huskarl as a leader, I like him with his shooting on threes, I felt that was quite strong and his splat is good as well in the right circumstances where you're facing a lot of AP1 and you can just reduce that with a splat. Uh, the Brockers were kind of disappointing, they did a good job at times in close combat but as soon as someone shoots them I find that they just die. The bike I think the bike would be great at a tournament that has just really garbage terrain tables where there's barely any buildings and just a couple of ruins but because the level of dead zone terrain is so high at these events then they're quite densely packed with buildings which is what you want to see but it also negatively affects vehicles that have to stay on the ground floor so bikes if in your local dead zone meta people don't have a lot of terrain available to them bikes would probably be better than they are so I still like it because even if it can't reach the enemy it's got a good shooting attack as well and there often are times where the enemy will need to be on the ground so it depends if you maybe set up your tables in such a way so that all the objectives aren't always on the top level looking at the different maps and seeing where they go and making sure there are some objectives that are going to be on the ground you can do that and you can let people know beforehand if you're running an event that that's the case so that they're more inclined to bring vehicles something to consider, otherwise they're kind of wasted sometimes. And especially on some very, some very nice, but some very, very specific uh, terrain setups. For example, if you have a bit of a canyon system, uh, maybe with dead ends in it, the bikes can sometimes end up with nowhere to deploy, or somewhere to deploy that's just a dead end, so that can be tricky. And uh, what else? 
think I've talked about everything in my list. The Forge Guard, the standard Forge Guard was fine. Did its job, didn't die very much. And yeah, I quite like this list. It was obviously strong. I was on the top table in for most of the day, in fact. And was on the top table in the final round, so you can't argue with that. And obviously could have very easily had a draw in the previous game. And I don't know if that would have affected the standings. We may well have been playing each other again anyway on this mission, which is obviously not one that I favour. Which missions would have been better for me against this uh, list? Probably one, if you look at the positioning of the Grogan, he can target both of the scoring areas, both of the big scoring areas from this tower. So any kind of setup where there's a tower centrally that's overlooking all the scoring areas is bad against that kind of unit. So. I'd have to look through the book to see which missions maybe would be better based on the deployment and the positioning of the objectives. But in general, I think it was tough. Don't have a lot of mobility outside of the bike, which can't climb up anywhere. So it might be worth persisting with this list archetype and making some tweaks. But I'm going to ponder on it and decide what to do, because I don't... Even though the Brockers are good at times, I don't like them as a troop choice. I think they die too easily for how much they cost. From being shot, specifically. But Steel Warriors are even more expensive, and the amount of Terratons that are around at the moment, the Steel Warrior, as I always say, is a Terratons' favourite snack. So I'm not sure they're going to be the hotness until maybe Terratons perhaps get a little bit of a nerf, which they should, and as a heavy Terraton player, I can say that, because I've used them to win many a tournament, so I'm happy for them to get a nerf. They are too good, especially I think the Plague ones, because they're so cheap. The Rebel ones are a bit more expensive because they have shooting attacks as well. Okay, time to wrap this one up folks, don't forget to check out all the links. Oh by the way, before I say that, I should tell you that I finished 4th out of 10, which is pretty good. I'll accept that, considering I did have to play against uh, the same really good Rebs list twice, and because of the scoring system actually, this player, despite winning four games, did not win the tournament. So isn't that controversial? And I can tell you that the player who won the tournament lost to me in the first round. What do you think about that? Controversial. But it depends on the margins of victory and that kind of thing. So obviously scoring systems are generally available before the event, so everyone should read the tournament packs, which I sometimes don't. So don't forget to check out all the links in the description, including a link to my next Dead Zone event, which takes place in Nottingham in May, which is on... So I just look in my notebooks to give you the exact day. I think it's the 19th of May. Let's just open my little book here. Yes, so my... Dead Zone event 19th of May in the centre of Nottingham and I've got a Kings of War event on the 18th of May also in the centre of Nottingham so if you're interested in either of those check out my Facebook send me a message on there or I think I've just put a link to the Dead Zone one in there as well there's also a deal so if you want to attend both of those events then you can get a cheaper price as well which the information is available in the link in the description if you want to see more tournament reports for various game systems and battle reports just non-stop gaming action then why not pledge all your life savings over to me via Patreon. In terms of what games I've got coming up I've got an old world game Warhammer the Old World coming up this week against Remington Steel and then there is an old world tournament in one week's time which is going to be my first one for that game system then after that there are two Kings of War tournaments back to back on a but on one weekend, so that's wild, one on Saturday, one on the Sunday, so that's going to be fun. One of them's 3,000 points as well, so that's going to be very fun. Then there's another Warhammer Old World event later in the month as well, so that's what's coming up in April. And then in May I've got my events, and there's a couple of others scattered in there as well, which there'll be more info later on. So keep your eyes peeled, lots of juicy content coming to this channel, lots more to come. And join me in praying that the Dead Zone Rules Committee do away with all the things I hate, such as stun grenades and things being very easily pinned and flames being too good, I think. Setting things on fire is a bit too effective at shutting things down that maybe shouldn't be shut down by being on fire. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe and all that stuff. 
send me all your money, all the good stuff obviously, and join the various social media down there. There's Discord, Facebook group, and Twitter and all that good stuff. And don't forget to leave your comments if you've got any thoughts on this tournament report, or if you've got any ideas for Forge Father lists perhaps. Or if you've picked up any helpful tips from this video, then why not let me know what they are. And I think all that remains to be said at this point is... Good night out there. Whatever you are.